ever wanted Mazda to be a bit more like Subaru? Yeah, me neither, but here we are. This is the 2023 Mazda CX-50, and it's kind of the brand's answer to vehicles like the Forester and the Outback, just a little bit more adventurous. How much more? Well, that's what we're here to find out, but before we do, a quick note. No, I did not wear this jacket to match the paint. That was purely coincidence, though I do think we make a pretty good pair. reviews don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that a little unconventional this week we are not doing our normal drive we are on the first drive of the 2023 mazda cx50 and that means we're up in the hockley valley just north of the gta checking out some of the great roads around here and some of the off-road no this isn't a hardcore off-roader but we do have a little bit of capability that Mazda wants to show off. So that's what we're going to check out here in a little bit. You know, this is a compact SUV from Mazda, but it is not a glorified CX-5. This is a totally different vehicle. It's actually built on a bigger platform of the CX-30. I've got reviews of both of those on the channel, so you can go and check those out. But this is similar in size to the CX-5 with a similar demeanor to the CX-30. And it's like I said off the top, this really is Mazda's take on the Subaru Forester or the Subaru Outback. That kind of built-in capability, even if you're not really planning on using it for what it's built to do, just to say you can do it, I guess. I don't know if that's the appeal, to look like you can do it. It does all of that. And we're going to find out just how much it can do off the beaten path just in a bit here. But I got to say, I do enjoy driving this thing out here on these roads. It's typical Mazda. It's nice to drive even for an SUV. Because it has that same sort of mannerism as the CX-30, it's definitely rigid. It kind of plays up that butch utility vehicle vibe. The steering is really heavy, but again, it's very nice to drive. Maybe not quite as smooth and refined as the CX-5, but not bad, all things considered. You know, if that is elegant, this is like L.L. Bean, okay? Bad joke, but you kind of get what I'm saying, right? It's kind of that pseudo-adventurous, maybe good for the city, but you could also use it out in the country and not look totally out of place. And now, like I said, we are heading to an off-road stretch here. This thing does have standard all-wheel drive. What's different about this versus the CX-5 or the CX-30 is it has a dedicated off-road mode. So that's gonna tailor the drivetrain to the conditions. The cool thing is Mazda, well, it's traction control system, instead of limiting wheel spin, which is what most of them do, it actually kind of encourages it. As Dave Coleman, who's the product guru over there who does all the drivetrain stuff, well, he talked about it like having the rest of the vehicle catch up. So it lets that wheel spin happen. Well, with this, when you have it in off-road mode, it changes so that when it recognizes one wheel is spinning, it's gonna send that torque to the other wheel because it's gonna figure, well, that one maybe has some traction. So it's gonna give you all that torque to either the left or the right wheel. Really cool the way it works. And I'm excited to see how it handles this kind of moderate off-road section we're about to come up to. All right, so here we are at the off-road section. So I'm gonna reach down to this My Drive selector and switch it into the off-road mode. That's about it. Now, no, this is not some sort of crazy off-road course like we did with that Ford Bronco or the Wrangler 4xE. That's not what this thing is built to do. So it's not that extreme, but this is supposed to be something a little gnarlier than you might get yourself into in a typical SUV. And the whole point is to see whether it can handle itself. And I gotta say, so far early going, lots of ice, big deep ruts in this trail, very smooth. It's very mellow. Now this is the GT with the turbo motor. So it makes something like 250 horsepower and 320 pound feet of torque. If it's on 93 octane fuel, I think if you put regular in it, it's still good for 227 horsepower 
and 310 pound feet of torque. So tons of output from this two and a half liter four cylinder. The base engine, that's still a two and a half liter, but it's naturally aspirated. I think it's good for 186 horsepower and 187 pound feet of torque. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure I'm remembering it correctly. But anyways, six speed automatic is the same and the all wheel drive system is the same too. So it's gonna shuffle that torque around. And this thing, I don't know, you guys are gonna see for yourselves pretty aggressive. What we're doing out here, I don't necessarily know that I would be comfortable doing with your average SUV. So I'm impressed that Mazda was confident enough to send us out on this test drive to see how it handles itself. And I'm just as impressed with how it's doing it. We're getting into some rocks here, a little bit of mud. It's still smooth. The steering feels very connected to the wheels. It's very direct, which I like, and that's very handy out on a trail like this one. Now we're getting into some really wet and sloppy stuff. And again, I've got these ruts. I mean, you can see the wheel moving, but even if I kind of intentionally slow down, it doesn't get stuck. It doesn't get bound up. It just kind of powers through. Having all that torque, turbocharged torque low down is really handy. And speaking of that, we have a towing test as well, which is really cool. With the turbo motor, this thing is good to pull. 3,500 pounds and apparently the trailer is maxed out. So that's gonna be cool to see how that feels. But I gotta say out here, this two and a half liter turbo is just what the doctor ordered. All that low end torque, heaven all of that. We've got some really crazy melted ruts here where the wheels are really sinking into it and we're kind of crashing into them a bit and it's just barely above 1500 RPM. Very impressed with the capability here. No, the capability here isn't like a Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk. It's not about what's added. It's about the fundamentals. So it can do anything, no matter which trim, they're all basically the same. And that's why I say it's more like a Forester or an Outback. Yes, those have the wilderness models. There is a Meridian coming that's gonna be a little bit more capable as far as what it can carry and its looks, but every trim can do basically the same thing. And that I very much appreciate. And then speaking of the fundamentals, well, the very design of this thing, it has practicality in mind. So if you take a look, the roof line is much lower than a typical SUV. This thing has a good inch more ground clearance than a CX-5, but it's actually a couple inches shorter because of that roof. I'm talking about the overall height. And then the roof has also been reinforced. So you can throw stuff on top of it, including rooftop tents. That's cool. But the downside of that lowered roof, rear headroom, it's terrible. Like there's less back seat headroom in here than in the tiny CX-30. It is no good. Now, of course, if you're just moving kids or you're a couple or even single and you don't have people in the back seat all that often, it's no big deal. But for me, it's a bit of a deal breaker to not be able to have four kind of full size seats. There's tons of leg room in the back, but just not enough headroom. Some other ways this nails the fundamentals of functionality around back of power tailgate that is standard across the lineup. So are these roof rails, by the way. But when you look behind that tailgate, there's close to 900 liters of cargo room. If I remember from the presentation earlier, it's not quite as much as a class leader like the Honda CRV, but it's pretty close. And the other cool thing is it's a very deep space, but it is also wide. It's nice and wide. The tailgate opening is too. And there's just tons of practicality. The load floor is flat with the tailgate opening. So you don't have to lug stuff up and down into it over some sort of hump. You can actually slide stuff straight in and out. That is very neat. And you know, overall it is practical. Aside from that headroom issue in the back, the cabin feels pretty good and it's got some decent features that come standard like heated seats, as well as all kinds of advanced safety features right down to adaptive cruise control. I'm pretty sure that's a first for Mazda that comes in every trim, including the cheapest version that starts right around 40 grand. And then this top one I'm driving, this is the GT with the turbo and it's right around 47 grand. It's a couple grand less if you skip the turbo, but I really would recommend opting for this engine if you're going for the GT trim because it is just so nice. It's nice and silky. And you know, when we were towing earlier, did a great job. This thing can pull 3,500 pounds, like I said, and we were pretty well maxed out. You can definitely feel the trailer back there. Yeah, you can see some suspension sag, 
but it was not bad at all. It was pulling nice and strong up some decent inclines. I was really impressed with the way that it worked. No, it's not something that I think you should invest in if you are going to tow all the time, but if you're towing here and there, feels like this thing is up to the job. Now, like I said, I am driving the top trim. So this one's loaded, heated and ventilated front seats, heated rear seats, heated steering wheel. It's got this big 10 and a half inch, I think, touch screen here, touch screen, okay? That's a new one for Mazda. This is a bit of an I told you so moment. For all those people in the CX-5 and CX-30 videos when I talked about how I wish it was a touch screen, yeah, Mazda finally listened to all those complaints. This is touch, but there is a catch. It only works as a touch screen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Otherwise, you still gotta use this rotary dial down here on the console. It's a bit of a puzzling one, but I'll take it because it is way less frustrating to use when I have my phone hooked up. And then as far as the looks are concerned, it's pretty good. Kind of looks like a CX-5 was put into a panini press and this was the result, but I really like the way some of it is different. It's a little bit more rugged. It's got those nice and boxy fenders, the chunky wheel arch moldings, those really aggressive, deeply inset headlights. I really like that a lot in here. It's typical Mazda, it's nice quality. I still don't think it can quite compete with proper premium brands like Lexus. I know that's something that Mazda talks about is this thing kind of nipping at the heels of the NX. I don't quite feel that, but it's not bad. It works well as a mainstream offering and it feels like a $47,000 SUV in here. I think that's the key. No, it doesn't feel like it's an imposter of a luxury vehicle, but it feels like for what you're getting, a mainstream compact crossover with a little bit more capability, decent room, except for the headroom in the back, good amenities, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, a touchscreen some of the time. Overall, not a bad package. Okay, so we're not quite as matchy-matchy anymore after a day bombing around on some beautiful but dirty country roads north of the GTA. And I gotta say, no, I didn't get to spend my full week with the CX-50, so stuff like fuel economy, that's gonna have to wait for my full review. But otherwise, I am very impressed with what Mazda has put together here, with a few exceptions, including some very thick A-pillars that do make outward visibility just a bit of a problem. But overall, I do like this thing a lot. And if you're shopping for a compact SUV with just a little more capability than the norm, I'd highly recommend putting the CX-50 on your shopping list.